Like all of Guillermo del Toro's films, Pinocchio is complex, deeply contemplative, and far more than it seems. Here's what this master of the macabre has to say about the classic tale. Spoilers ahead. The historical setting of Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio immediately lets you know that the film will have a more serious focus than past versions of the story. The beginning of the movie takes place during World War I, and as warplanes are making their way back to base, they drop bombs just to lighten their load. One of those bombs lands on Geppetto's church and kills his son Carlo. From there, the film's anti-war message becomes even more explicit. By the time Geppetto creates Pinocchio, many years have passed. World War I has come to a close, but Benito Mussolini has come to power in Italy, and fascists dominate almost every aspect of daily life in Geppetto's town and the surrounding areas. Geppetto, like many of the other Italian citizens, does his best to play along with what the fascists want to avoid any violence at their hands. Pinocchio isn't so agreeable. He's a rambunctious young boy who likes to do things his way. Just by being himself, Pinocchio shines a light on just how wrong the fascist belief system is. The primary antagonist of the film, the carnival owner Count Volpe, and the government representative Podesta are both fascists who want to crush Pinocchio's spirit for the glory of the fatherland. It's Pinocchio's individualist streak, unlimited optimism, and empathy for other people that ultimately allow him to prevail over his foes. In all its different forms, Pinocchio's story is partly a coming-of-age tale about a boy learning how to be good and take responsibility for his actions. In most versions of the tale, like Disney's classic rendition from the 1940s, learning to be good is synonymous with learning to obey the people who are supposed to be in charge. Pinocchio usually learns that if he follows what the adults in his life tell him, then things will generally work out for him. In Guillermo del Toro's version of the story, however, most of the adults in Pinocchio's life are fascists, espousing terrible rules and life philosophies that only serve to devalue other people. Look at my boy Candlewick. Yes, yes. A model fascist youth. Proud, brave, virile. Geppetto might not truly be a fascist himself, but even Pinocchio's father can't serve as a great example for the young boy because he's willing to go along with what the fascists want. Unlike past versions of the story, Pinocchio in this film doesn't need to learn how to obey. His disobedience is what sets him apart from the other people in his life, and it's what makes him a hero. For Del Toro, Pinocchio's disobedience in the film is the whole point. Speaking with the Washington Post, he said, "...disobedience now is more urgent than ever. Pinocchio's real journey through the movie is learning how to use that disobedience to help others, like when he breaks death's rules and hourglass to save Geppetto's life." Pinocchio doesn't learn how to be obedient in the film, but he does learn how to be good. At the beginning of the movie, Pinocchio breaks rules to get what he wants. He leaves Geppetto's house to follow his father to church. He skips out on going to school because he wants to drink hot chocolate at the carnival. By the end of the movie, he's breaking rules to save lives. What changed? Pinocchio's journey away from home takes him through plenty of hardships, but two moments in particular demonstrate how Pinocchio's experiences cause him to change his attitude in life. First, Pinocchio sees Count Volpe beating and berating Spazzatura. He immediately steps in to defend the monkey, and when that doesn't work, the two of them conspire to sabotage the Count's performance for Mussolini. Later, Pinocchio is taken to a training camp for fascist soldiers. There, he comes to understand that his old bully, Candlewick, was just being cruel because that's what his father, Podesta, taught him to do. Pinocchio and Candlewick become friends and rebel against Podesta's rules. Throughout the film, Pinocchio suffers, but he also witnesses the suffering suffering of others at the hands of the people in charge. All of that convinces him to change the way he goes about disobeying and transforms him into a true hero. Pinocchio isn't the only one who changes over the course of the film. He also transforms the people who are closest to him. Geppetto goes through the biggest change, but Sebastian's transformation has the biggest effect on the film's plot. After Geppetto loses his son Carlo, all his joy for life vanishes. His work slows down to the point that even when his town's church gets rebuilt, he never finishes his new crucifix carving because he spends the majority of his time drinking. The war ends in 1918, Benito Mussolini rises to power in Italy in 1922, and Geppetto remains lost. The wood sprite gives Pinocchio life so he can bring joy back into Geppetto's life. The two of them get off to a rough start, but by the end of the movie, Geppetto has found love and motivation all over again. He's willing to risk being eaten by a monstrous sea creature just to see Pinocchio again. Sebastian begins as a self-centered writer whose main interest in Pinocchio is that he already has a home set up inside the wood of the puppet's body. The wood sprite promises Sebastian one wish if he teaches Pinocchio to be good, but things work out in the opposite direction. Sebastian tries giving Pinocchio a lesson or two, but by spending time with the boy, Sebastian himself learns to be more selfless. He uses his wish not for fame, but to bring Pinocchio back to life.
Well, gosh darn it. I wish him back to life. There's another character in the movie who goes through a drastic change thanks to Pinocchio, and his transformation mirrors Pinocchio's growth. Candlewick is the son of Podesta, a war-obsessed fascist government official who lives in Pinocchio's town. When the boys first meet, Candlewick takes a cue from his father and acts like a bully toward Pinocchio, going so far that he convinces Pinocchio to stick his wooden legs in a fire. All that changes in the film's final act. Podesta ships Candlewick off to a special military training camp for young boys, and eventually Pinocchio finds himself there as well. Podesta is obsessed with the idea of using Pinocchio as an immortal soldier, but neither of the children is genuinely interested in fighting a war. At the training camp, Candlewick confesses to Pinocchio that he just wants to make his father proud of him, and Pinocchio comforts him by telling him all fathers love their sons, but fathers are still people and don't always behave the way they should. In a training exercise, Pinocchio and Candlewick come to a tie, and Podesta orders his son to shoot his new friend. Candlewick refuses, finally telling his father that he doesn't need his approval. He and Pinocchio rebel against the camp's leadership just as bombs begin to fall. Guillermo del Toro spends some time musing on mortality in Pinocchio. Shortly after Count Volpe's carnival is introduced, the Count and Geppetto get into a fight over Pinocchio that ends when the puppet gets hit by Podesta's car. To the humans, it appears as though Pinocchio died, but he wakes up in a version of the afterlife populated by skeletal rabbits and a sphinx-like creature called Death, who says that the wood sprite is her sister. Death tells Pinocchio that the wood sprite brought him to life because she doesn't care about following rules. Then Death explains the rules of Pinocchio's new, almost afterlife. Every time he dies, he'll arrive in her world and have to wait for larger and larger hourglasses to run through their sand before he gets sent back to the world of the living. Near the end of the movie, Pinocchio dies while Geppetto is drowning, and he breaks the hourglass to get back more quickly, even though it means he'll become truly mortal. Pinocchio dies one final time in his efforts to save Geppetto, but thanks to Sebastian's wish and the wood sprite's magic, he gets resurrected and has the chance to live out his life with his family. Death may have warned Pinocchio that by breaking the hourglass he'd gain mortality and become a real boy, but she also knew that her sister would intervene. Death's warning was more about testing Pinocchio's character than it was about limiting his lifespan. When Sebastian enters the film, he begins narrating different events. He explains that when he first met Pinocchio, he was a writer working on a book about his life, and he tells the story of how he first got involved with Geppetto, his puppet, and the wood sprite. At the end of the film, Sebastian talks about Pinocchio's long life with Geppetto and Spazzatura, who both eventually die as Pinocchio goes on agelessly. In some instances of Sebastian's narration, the camera shows him writing as he's speaking, which make it all the more surprising when Sebastian begins to narrate over his own death. Just after seeing that Sebastian, like the others, died, we catch up with him in the afterlife, playing cards with the skeletal rabbits who work for death. The transition makes for a quick twist. It reveals that all this time Sebastian wasn't narrating from some grand book that he wrote about his adventures. He gave up that dream to save Pinocchio's life. Instead, Sebastian has been telling his life story to the disinterested rabbits over a few hands of poker. The darkly humorous turn in the story is emblematic of what sets Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio apart from other takes on the story. Sadly, Pinocchio outlives Geppetto, Spazzatura, and Sebastian. He's not a human being, and he never ages, even as the people around him do. The tragic part of his existence is something that Death warns him about when he first visits her domain. Initially, Pinocchio is thrilled at the prospect of being immortal, but Death tells him that immortality is more of a curse than a blessing. Life can bring great suffering, and eternal life can bring eternal suffering. When Pinocchio decides to break Death's hourglass so he has enough time to save Geppetto from drowning in the sea, she tells him that not following her rules will make him mortal again. Does the wood sprite's final spell, fulfilling Sebastian's wish, undo Pinocchio's newfound mortality? Yes and no. Pinocchio is still on his last life like Death told him he would be. The wood sprite gives him one more chance at that life, but she doesn't make Pinocchio truly immortal again the way he was before breaking the hourglass. That said, Pinocchio is still a wooden puppet, so he isn't likely to die from old age anytime soon. At the end of the film, Sebastian says that he imagines Pinocchio didn't live forever, but his friend still gets to have an extraordinarily long life compared to normal humans. In the film, Death claims that Pinocchio's realness is tied to his mortality. She says that human life is unique because it is short. But even though Pinocchio gets to live for a very long time, he's still gone through the transformation of becoming a real boy by the end of the film. 
In more traditional versions of Pinocchio's story, like Disney's classic film, his journey ends when he gets magically transformed into a physical human being. That was never going to be the case in Guillermo del Toro's version. Speaking with Vanity Fair, del Toro revealed, To me, it's essential to counter the idea that you have to change into a flesh-and-blood child to be a real human. All you need to be human is to really behave like one, you know? Pinocchio's transformation from an inhuman puppet to a real boy was a slow process that began when he first met Geppetto at the beginning of the film. In a way, every interaction he had with the people he met further pushed him toward humanity. But it was the moment that Pinocchio smashed Death's hourglass that sealed his fate. By being so full of love that he was willing to sacrifice his own life, Pinocchio truly embodied what it means to be human. Despite her massive impact on everything that happens to Geppetto, Sebastian, and Pinocchio, the movie doesn't reveal all that much about the wood sprite. She first appears as a collection of glowing orbs that seemingly take interest in Geppetto's suffering as he chops down a tree while mourning the death of his son Carlo. In his narration, Sebastian admits that he knows very little about what the orbs are or why they're suddenly flocking to Geppetto's side. Later, when Pinocchio visits the afterlife for the first time, Death tells him that the wood sprite is her sister. The two of them share a resemblance with large wings that appear to have eyeballs sticking out all over them. But Death gets more screen time and has much more to say than her sister. In her final appearance in the film, the wood sprite grants Sebastian his wish and returns Pinocchio to life. It seems like she might have known that things would work out this way all along. To save you, he became a real boy. And real boys don't come back. However, it's unclear how much she and her sister communicated and planned during the events of the film. Ultimately, the wood sprite has little to say or reveal. She's simply a mysterious force of nature that will never be fully understood.